we are beginning to understand that the emotional nature of man is not a simple structure, but a very complex organism, and that in its natural, normal state, it is almost unknown to the average person. We realize the training and discipline required to achieve bodily control, as in the case of the musician, or the dancer, or the vocalist. We also know that the mind must be educated in order that it may function adequately and be a useful servant to us in the advancement of our daily affairs. By the same type of thinking, we realize also that the emotions must be in one way or another cultivated if they are to be powerful, constructive forces in our lives. The early experience of man led to the development of aesthetics, that part of philosophy essentially devoted to the education of the emotions. And in our modern way of life, this part of our necessary discipline is of all the parts most completely neglected. Yet this neglect is so chronic and so widespread that we have gradually ceased to believe that the compound parts of our dispositions require discipline. We like to assume that we will be matured by the simple processes of living and therefore that we do not need to give special attention to the cultivation of any attribute. Actually, today, our compound nature is more confused than matured by the courses of action which most of us choose or are required to follow. It therefore means that essentially speaking, the inner life of the person is not adequately cultivated. And such refinement as is uh, brought about is without adequate motivation. And in the world of ethics, motives are highly important. In fact, the most important element in almost all the equations of growth. The individual, therefore, is apt to find his body rebellious, his emotions inconsistent, and his intellect opinionated. These troublesome discoveries should lead naturally to self-improvement. But in many, in most instances, they do not lead to self-improvement. The individual gradually becomes more or less accustomed to his own inconsistency, takes them for granted, expects others to endure them, and tries to live with them himself. This is really more than a good try. It is a real trial before he gets through. It means that we have to, in some way, integrate and organize resources. Western thinking, which is more or less aggressive by basic concept, encourages us, therefore, to browbeat ourselves into a state of grace. We are supposed to use whatever force or means may be necessary and to 
practically, resolutely correct our own faults. This program has never been especially attractive with the majority of persons. Eastern philosophy recommends that we relax away from our intensity and by so doing give normal function an opportunity to reveal itself. Most persons are afraid of normal function. They do not need to be. Nature is essentially a constructive instrument, and the individual who achieves a state of adjustment with nature is usually benefited and advanced by such an adjustment. To relax away from tension, however, means that we must gradually shift our points of view particularly our standard of values. Most of our troubles lie with our standards of value. And while these become the determining and determining factors, our intensities continue to multiply and our difficulties increase. In human emotion, uh, particularly in the field of human affections, standards of value must be envisioned, must be experienced or discovered or realized by the individual. Most of the emotional unhappiness through which we pass is a kind of discipline intended to reveal to us the immaturity of ourselves. If we would accept these lessons with a degree of personal recognition, much good would be accomplished, but usually difficulties lead rather to rebellion, <coughs> discouragement, disillusionment, and a feeling of futility. Why we should feel this futility is difficult to understand. Because most modern persons have been raised with a certain amount of educational background. They have learned from mathematics that two and two together will be four. And the same in conduct. That certain causes must produce effects consistent with themselves. If we are dissatisfied with the effects, we should examine the causes. Yet to do this is a further humiliation. The individual does not like to recognize defects in himself. He feels in some way that they uh, depreciate his net worth, that he will not be as well regarded by others, that his natural ego will be offended and disillusioned. How much more seriously, however, do we misrepresent ourselves and convey uh, the sense of insecurity when we permit destructive patterns to dominate conduct until perhaps we are disgraced by our actions more than we would be uh, disillusioned by self-analysis? Self-analysis, however, can go too far. It can be a tyrant, causing us to become more and more self-centered, which is certainly not the end of the program or work at hand. So there are many extremes and variations which we should avoid. There are many problems which we are not equipped to handle. But at the same time, there are things we can do which will enrich ourselves as persons. And this morning we want to study certain <coughs> phases of the problem of human affections and why it is that so many persons are miserable because of emotional 
attachments or antipathies nourished, sustained, and perpetuated under the broad term human love. Usually when we try to understand something, we must first of all define terms in order that we may be thinking together or that we will have a common point of view. But the term love is a very difficult one to define. Like most of the great total words which we use, its meaning is so great that it gradually becomes meaningless. We are no longer able to limit it or bring into our mind with the definition any useful correlatives, meanings which help us to understand or to visualize or to internally experience the significance of the words that we use. The term love is generally regarded as an intense affection. The individual, for some reason which he may or may not understand, is strongly drawn to other persons or to things or to conditions and develops toward them an intense emotional reaction. Love in the classical definition of the term is an emotion of the soul. Therefore, its complete satisfaction and integration must take place upon the psychic level of the personality. At the same time, love certainly manifests through its effect upon both the mental and the physical integration of the individual. Presumably, man having an emotional nature. This nature should be integrated and focused upon its own level. In other words, it should flow into manifestation along natural and pleasant paths of expression. This is not usually the case today. And gradually, the experience of love becomes defined through a series of reflexes or reactions, many of them painful, difficult, uncertain, disturbing, confusing, and disorienting. Thus, the emotion is feared by a great many and is certainly abused by the majority. Yet all these difficulties being true, the essential nature of the fact remains that man has an irresistible and inevitable instinct to love and be loved, and that the fulfillment of life requires a maturing of these instincts and these requirements through an adequate self-expression. It therefore would seem practical, perhaps first of all, uh, to attack this problem on the level of the common experience of the person and to realize that a very large part of the psychological field today is devoted uh, to the solution of problems arising from the complexities of human relations on an emotional level. Wherever we find uh, psychic abnormalcy, we have powerful emotional disturbance. And love and hate are the two great disturbing factors. Not necessarily because love in itself disturbs, but because pure love from a psychic level is practically unknown and beyond definition. What we call love is this intensity of emotion, 
arising not from the nature of the psyche itself, but emerging already heavily conditioned by circumstances that have no place there, and therefore predispose the individual to kinds of affectional expressions that are not constructive. We find, for instance, that one of the most common uh, problems in connection with human affections is selfishness. Actually and factually, love and selfishness cannot exist together. But for the majority of human beings, the terms are practically synonymous. We expect selfishness in connection with affection. We expect possessiveness, which is a form of selfishness. We expect the individual to be unreasonable as a proof of his devotion. If he does not lose his common sense, he has not really a bad attack. <laughs> Therefore, to us, the very symptoms of affection are symptoms of something else masquerading under some form of emotional intensity. Selfishness is a form of egotism and always involves egocentricity in some of its manifestations. We therefore observe that in the practical field of human uh, relationships the individual is not moved to the simple expression of his emotions uh, by completely honest and honorable intentions, but by intensities which are highly conditioned by other factors. Thus we have, besides the natural psychic flow of affection, Involvements arising from the mind and, evolve, and involvements arising from the body. When either of these get too closely involved in the problem of love, something of importance is lost. And love becomes a servant of some other purpose of the personality. This causes the rise of ulterior motive. An ulterior motive is a wonderful and subtle thing and is most present where least suspected. A great many persons would take their oath upon their sacred scripture and also be perfectly willing to go on the polygraph or a lie detection test and insist that their emotions are honest. But of course a great deal of the term honesty is a matter of interpretation. People mean to be honest, but honesty, like great virtue, is difficult of attainment and is seldom present in a complete form, especially where life itself is confused and disordered. So we begin to see or understand why people do things and how the things they do react upon them. Let's take a few examples of what we mean by selfishness at the root of love. In the course of years, a great many persons have come to me who have complained about what might be termed a mediocre marriage. Nothing wrong, nothing right exceedingly dull. These individuals have in a number of instances under some encouragement admitted that behind their marriage was an ulterior motive. These persons admitted that they married for security. Now there are 
reasons why this might seem to be a very good thing to do. And unfortunately, parental advice has often been involved in this particular situation. An unhappy parental environment has caused the parent to be disillusioned, and he passed on his disillusionment to the child by explaining that, that a marriage was largely a matter of security and look for it. So this is too common an incident to be passed over lightly. And it is present frequently in marriages in which the elements of the marriage are highly heterogeneous. Great discrepancies in age, great discrepancies in class, are very often associated with marriages for security. Now in the course of time, this element in the pattern has gradually dropped out of sight. The person no longer remembers that that was the basic motivation, or if not basic, one of several vital considerations. This security was frequently attained and nothing else, which actually is perfectly good, honest circumstance. It's exactly what should have happened, but nobody liked it when it did. The individual who decides the direction of his conduct may find that he gets the things that he wants, only to discover that they no longer meet his needs. Another group of persons marry, not perhaps so much from security, but because of a tremendous insecurity on an internal level. People have told me that they married because they just couldn't live alone any longer. Now there's a noble emotion. <laughs> they could not get along with themselves, so they wanted to share the situation. <laughs> Now, it is true that the instinct is, as the good book tells us, that it is not good for man to live alone. But this in itself does not become a formula. And certainly human emotions uh, should not be expected to build and flourish around so negative a basic impulse. So these persons who just couldn't stand being alone make a discovery as they go through the years that you can be just as much alone with someone as you can by yourself. In fact, more so. Because with someone, even your aloneness may be unpleasantly disturbed. In this uh, sense of the word, therefore, the individual who is moved to a positive action by a negative pressure is going to get into trouble. It is psychologically an unsound attitude toward life. Now, this, of course, represents two comparatively common uh, types of emotional intensity. Both essentially selfish. Now there are others, and there is a static one, in which marriage is regarded as a kind of general panacea for the absence of itself. In other words, the individual who does not know what is wrong decides that perhaps if he marries it will all straighten out. That is sheer optimism. <laughs> His friends point out 
that uh, he has been a bachelor too long, or her friends say that if she remains a bachelor girl much longer, she may never marry. So this suddenly becomes a powerful uh, reason to stimulate this phase of the emotional reflex. And of course, the moment attention is fixed upon any faculty, power, or circumstance, the probabilities of its activation are increased. So the individual who came to me about three months ago and said they married because they didn't know what else to do was not exactly building upon a solid foundation. These kinds of attitudes are increasingly prevalent. Then there is a type of marriage that does not uh, go into such rarefied atmosphere of abstraction and might be termed marriage for comfort, just in order that physical things will work out better. The man who marries so that he can have three square meals a day, or who is tired of donning his own socks, or something of that nature. These trivia are unsuspectedly present where they should not be. After a while, perhaps, as in the case of certain Oriental marriages where the young people do not meet until the wedding day, uh, association may strengthen relations, new values may be discovered, uh, something good may come out of it, but today, with the increasing individualization of peoples, uh, the probabilities are not as favorable as they were long ago. Another problem and selfishness in connection with marriage is the increasing defensiveness of the individual in marriage, increasingly determining to maintain a complete separateness of living, even when in the marital state. Thus today, marriage becomes to many persons a greater opportunity to advance themselves in some respect rather than to plan toward any common good. Thus, the home becomes little better than an improved boarding house. And the actual elements of understanding are reduced more or less to an economic partnership with all kinds of qualifying attitudes. If these conditions continue, the home is naturally going to be uh, disturbed and in danger. Yet it is hard for a lot of people to realize that a decision made perhaps in an hour, 25 years ago, can be held morally responsible for 25 years of basic domestic incompatibility. It seems like the punishment does not fit the crime, that it is excessive, and that the person uh, should not be so penalized. In a sense, that would be true if the decision made 20 or 25 years ago had since been changed, but very often it has not. The individual, having established this pattern, remains locked in it. And even though it has brought him suffering, it has not brought him a sufficient resolution to change his ways or change his basic attitudes. He is still selfish, even though selfishness has brought him nothing but sorrow. Now, most of these individuals who have these uh, ulterior motives could not face themselves if they made a clear, unconditioned statement of such motivation. Thus, these motives are submerged 
or bury. And the individual tries to tell himself and others that he really married for love. If he tells it long enough, he almost believes it. But under analysis or in the press, uh, presence of pressure, the truth comes out. That love has been used and abused and perverted in order to, uh, to supply the means of accomplishing an end not itself essentially worthy. And such misuse of emotions will always result in emotional tragedy through the deepening and intensifying of destructive emotional habits. Now in addition to selfishness, which comes in numerous forms and is often highly glamorized, there are other uh, conditions which may affect uh, the success of marriage and condition human emotions. One of these is tradition. The traditional attitude toward things or an acceptance of an authoritarian pattern to be imposed upon conduct. Thus, marriages today are sometimes overshadowed by the psychology of marriage of centuries gone by and are thereby held in patterns which are not successful. Actually, we must learn sometimes, some way, that true love is a releasing and not a controlling force. The proof of true love is that we desire the happiness of those that we do love. And we desire this happiness above all personal considerations. I tried to explain that situation once, and the individual I talked to said, well, if I do nothing but think about the happiness of others, who's going to worry about me? Who's going to care whether I'm happy or not? Well, that is the uh, interesting phase of what might be termed the successful relation of human beings on the level of love. And that is that while we worry about other people's happiness, or put it first, if situations are reasonable, the other person is doing the same for us, so we are not left out in the cold. And uh, where this reciprocity does not exist, then we have a situation that needs investigation. But one of the reasons why other people are not as eager uh, to regard us with affection as we would desire may well be that we are taking such good care of ourselves from that level that there is really no need for any assistance. The individual finds the greater happiness and the greater security in the power to express toward the object of affection. And where this object of affection is closed, is all wound up in itself is apparently completely self-sufficient in its own internal emotion. There is not very much opportunity for exchange and not much inducement to unselfishness. Thus we may have definitely reasoned that the natural desire of affection is to serve that which it loves. And if there is nothing in no way in which such service can reasonably be rendered, then we have another kind of frustration, one that is too frequent and too common at the present time. Yet for the most part, we are not burdened in clinical research with unselfish persons who have been completely blocked in their effort to help others. 
So we now have to begin by a little study of unselfishness in this sense. Namely, that we wish the happiness of others. Now, I think we all do in a general way, except that when it interferes with our own, we kind of draw back and take an attitude of reservation on the subject. We want everyone to be happy as long as their happiness agrees with us. And very often in emotional relationships, we feel that the legal and social uh, obligations and privileges of these relationships include the right to cause other persons or to force other persons to do the things that we demand of them in the name of happiness. The attitude that if other persons would do what we want them to, they would be happy is one of the biggest mistakes in history. Yet it is very common for the individual, naturally rather egotistic and not particularly happy himself, to know just how the other person can find the fulfillment of his soul's and heart's desire. So happiness, although we are seeking to bestow it, will not result while we are not in a position to administer even our own unselfishness intelligently. Nearly always in human relationships, two persons settle down together in life with the secret subjective determination to reform each other. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder how they ever got together in the first place if each one was in such desperate need of reformation. You'd have thought they would have run in opposite directions immediately. So we feel that the greatest good we can do for anyone is to change them. And the second greatest good is to make sure that they do not change us. <laughs> now this locking can become rather brutal. Yet it will always be under the most benevolent de uh, terms and descriptions. All we are doing is what is the greatest good. We are actually suffering, laboring, striving, like Atlas trying to hold up the whole universe in a desperate effort to help this other person to be happy. And the other person is just a plain, unmitigated ingrate. Not recognizing the fact that we have given the best years of our lives to an effort we should never have made in the first place. <laughs> now this means, of course, that this effort to bestow happiness is based upon uh, a recognition of certain character or personality inconsistencies. We do not mean the reformation of a criminal character or something of that nature, but in the simple human relations of life. We feel that the, we are able, from our own position, to judge what will produce happiness. Actually, we should be able to do a pretty good job of diagnosing, particularly after many years of association. We should have a fair knowledge of what will help another person to be happy. Now, there are many schools of thought on the subject of happiness. Happiness is not a state of perpetual hilarity. Happiness is actually a byproduct of integration and that which helps the individual to be his own best ultimately helps him to be happy. But happiness is very much blocked 
when any stream of energy moves only in one direction. So we have these two contendants in the corners of the ring waiting for the referee's signal in an effort to do ten rounds on making each other happy. They really settle down to this with tremendous intensity. And as life is nearly always polarized, in each of these combinations there will be a static and a dynamic factor. One person will be the more aggressive of the two. And at some stage in this conflict, one will arise as dominant, and the other will take a subdominant position. Now this seems to be a desirable state, because if we can reach the point where we have overcome the resistance of the other individual, and our opinions, our attitudes, our advice, our suggestions, and our recommendations, are almost immediately accepted. And we've really got this plastic material where we can mold it just the way we want to. We have achieved one of the most brilliant defeats in history. And after this has been accomplished for a time, uh, a new emotion creeps in. We become utterly bored because all of the challenge is taken out of life. When one individual dominates another completely, either mediocrity of relation or a broken home is inevitable. There's nothing left. So the dominant individual continues to send a tremendous amount of psychic energy in the direction of the dominated one. And this flow of energy continues to cause the dominated person to become weaker. Little by little, all of the vitality, all of the essential libido in the dominated person wears out, disappears, becomes submerged, causing either a tremendous neurotic pressure, which will break out someday, or simply grinding this person down to a point of complete acceptance and a very dull measure of life. So love tells us, when we think about it seriously, that there is nothing more fatal than the constant motion of it without discipline in any direction. Because just as surely as we need to express affection, so we must give others an opportunity also to express affection, to release themselves by doing things for us. It is very difficult to do things for a person who is more completely dominant than we are. And the more we create dominance in ourselves, the more we discourage emotion of energy from other persons. Here's a very common example that doesn't involve affection particularly, but is a good case at point. Many persons are able to give with great joy and become totally miserable when they have to receive. It is wonderful to bestow our abundance upon those around us but we become shy and embarrassed and unhappy and actually miserable when someone tries to do something for us. This is wrong, because we have just as much responsibility to help another person to express their feelings and to find their joys as we have in imposing things upon them. This is one of the reasons why patronage and philanthropy have always been a miserable confusion. It takes the greatest wisdom and skill in the world to know how to help other people. And the best way to help them always is to find ways to help them to help themselves, which means to express themselves. And in home life, and in home relationship, and in affection, 
The natural instinct should be to release the other person and not to possess them. For by releasing them, we give them chance to grow and to develop more desirable qualities which we shall still more intensely admire. But where we find it to our own liking to force them into patterns similar to our own, we not only injure them but destroy contrast in relationships. Because actually the purpose of human relationships is an interchange of experience and not merely the dominance of one pattern. And the person who destroys the separateness in another destroys his privilege to learn about those other things uh, with which he is not acquainted. Homes have been broken, for example, because of professional differences, in which perhaps a lawyer married to a musician, neither of these persons ever understood or appreciated the dynamic of the other. Instead of wishing to understand this dynamic, each one wanted to prevent the other person from continuing their career, because this career was the thing that seemed to stand between them. Actually, it was not the career that stood between them. It was the negative attitude of each person to the achievements and the field of activity which have been dominated or developed by the other. Actually, the lawyer could have become an infinitely better person had he taken an interest in music and had found a powerful link with what was to him an unknown world. So because of the great desire to be comfortable, the tremendous disinclination to exert oneself, the individual attempted uh, to block the challenge by preventing its continuance. All this done under some subtle pretext of affection, but actually a simple statement of personal selfishness. In the Oriental philosophy, the problem of love was probably analyzed more systematically than by any Western scholar or Western school. And these ancient philosophers and mystics came to the conclusion that what we call emotion primarily and basically is man's instinct to share in a common spiritual experience. In other words, it is escape from a strange kind of subjective isolation. Not loneliness upon the personal level, but the individual's instinctive and inevitable realization that he is isolated by his own consciousness that no matter what he does or how hard he tries, he can never actually share the consciousness of anything else. The only solution to the Easterner was the gradual and inevitable disciplining of the being, until in some remote era yet to come, man might presumably attain a universal consciousness. But here and now, he is separate from the ability to know any life except his own life. This uh, inability to know is bridged by a series of instincts. Through the mind, he seeks to understand what he cannot experience. And through the emotions, he seeks to experience what he cannot understand. He is moving constantly away from this complete 
exile of the entity within him. Of course, Buddhism went on and pointed out that these drives arise from an entity which is itself illusional. And that the great illusion that lies at the root of it all, whether it be the emotion of affection or the cycle of rebirth, that the great emotional pressure or the great illusion at the root of things is this illusion of selfness. That the individual, through tradition, through association, and through history, and particularly through the physical body, which is the focus of his faculty, has exaggerated the sense of his own identity. And that it is this exaggeration which has made him alone. That it is this exaggeration which causes him to fight continuously for the preservation of his own illusion of being a separate, indistinct, individuality. He has been taught that anything which hazards this individuality threatens his survival. So in all relationships, his primary move is to preserve this individuality, not realizing that the longer he preserves it, the more completely he must be alone, inasmuch as alone is rooted in this concept of individuality. On this thinking, then, the universal psychobiological significance of marriage becomes obvious. It is essentially a means of reducing the pressure of the individuality. And we see the descent of it in the history of the race in the gradual rise of social institutions and the gradual broadening of the foundation of affection. And we know from the Greeks who created their ladder of Eros or their ladder of love that the emotion passes through a series of refinements and enlargements by means of which it leads ultimately toward escape from hyper-individualism. It is frustrated today, however, because this is an era in which individualism is emphasized as never before, with the result that the American home is more shaky than it has ever been before. It has lost too much and discovered too little in terms of values tells us that the most simple, rudimentary, basic, and infantile of all emotions is love of self. Now, on that basis, we have quite a few perpetual adolescents floating around today. Because nearly everything we do in life is geared to an inordinate regard for ourselves. And a subconscious assumption that we are infallible. Cause it never proves itself, but we can still try. Furthermore, the more unbalanced or excessive our instinct of infallibility is, the more we defend it. And we defend it by preventing it from coming into contact with fact. We are afraid that the contest would not favor us in the long run. Therefore, we do not open ourselves to it. And we therefore also become antisocial or bury ourselves in groups of similar opinion simply because we are afraid to test our own uh, attitudes on the open field of merit. But this sense of infallibility built around the love of self and inordinate regard for self is almost a form of ego idolatry. It is the strange determination under all conditions to preserve that which is most advantageous to the self. And each individual defines the word advantageous 
according to his own conclusions at the moment. With this attitude, we realize that man has reached the circumference of the cycle of diversity. Because when each individual is completely separate, and each is completely superior to all others, we have come to the most adequate definition of confusion. There is no order and no arrangement in such a pattern. But even modern philosophies have been built upon this concept. Yet in man's natural experience in nature, we find the gradual emergence from ancient times of the family, which was the smallest and most basic social unit. The family became acceptable because of the rise of the possessive instinct, and the individual gradually included within himself, or as part of himself, certain others bound to him by ties of blood or marriage. They were his. They became part of the inner circle of his own infallibility. Because they were his, they were like himself. And because they were his, he was justified in defending, protecting, and advancing them, not for their own sake, but because they were his. And that little habit, which belongs to about the two-year-old in cosmic evolution, is still rather prevalent among those who had certainly not like to be regarded as uh, primitive, but it is still there. The primitive instinct uh, to find gratification or satisfaction for self uh, by adorning or enriching or ennobling those which are of our own kind as against all the others. Out of this also emerged another kind of inclusiveness, and that was the inclusiveness of the tribe. Tribal consciousness originated, and the individual by psychology associated himself with a social, racial, religious, or political group. It was his group. Therefore, toward that group, he had a certain pride, not because the group was better but because the group was his. And he became quite patriotic in the defense of his group. He might die for it. He might give all his life to the service of it, because it was his. And if he was sufficiently philanthropic in the support of his group, he was regarded as a great lover of that group, a great admirer of it a champion of it. And with the passing of time, these addictions passed out into broader fields to cover arts and crafts for which individuals developed great emotional attachments. Later came from the tribe the greater conglomerate, the nation, in which the individual began to feel that within himself or within his own psychic life was the power to include all held together by some large pattern of allegiances. And he began to consider himself as belonging to a large group, his group, a group wonderfully better because uh, it was his, and perhaps subconsciously because he was one of them. It was a better group because it was his. And so his possessiveness continued to increase and to expand, bringing with it, however, a certain subtle enlargement of his recognition of things acceptable to himself. Finally, perhaps a great motion like a world religion united many races and nations under another common allegiance. These persons were right because they were like himself. They agreed with what he agreed with. And thus he began to owe them a certain 
loyalty because together they must protect what he believed. So on the sense of this self-righteousness and self-inevitability, cultures and civilizations were built up. Yet through all of these, there were also certain refinements. Prejudices had to be overcome. Differences had to be reconciled or ignored. And little by little, the individual accepting ever greater collectives within his own consciousness had to recognize the dawning factor of individuality within unity. And finally, we have laws such as we have in the world today which preserve the rights of individuals, even in collective patterns, giving these persons the privilege of acting in conformity with conscience so long as this conformity does not endanger the unity of the group or the collective pattern. So as man grew from within himself by patterns that are quite obvious, his emotions became accustomed uh, to the acceptance of things which were not immediately understandable or classifiable within his basic psychic instinct. He enriched, he broadened, he deepened. Until today, the average person appreciates many things that he does not understand and tolerates, perhaps grudgingly, many ideas and beliefs with which he disagrees. But it is still true that under pressure, if the intellectual level is reduced in any way, fanaticism can still flare out in all its intensities because it is still there. And this fanaticism is always associated with the tremendous emotional conviction of the inevitable rightness of the individual himself. In these things, then, the human emotions are long and old and wise in their development. And yet they can and do produce a series of immediate difficulties when we break this point of history at any point which we call now and go to work with the accumulation, the residue, and the opinions and prejudices that have come down through the ages from the past. In the Greek ladder, then, of emotion, the love of self was, of course, the basis. It was the complete dedication of the individual to the survival of his own composite. He could bear no one and nothing that differed from him, because everything that differed attacked him. And on various levels, because it, if it attacked him, in terms of theology, it was heresy and might lead to the most terrible and painful consequences. As the time went on, this a basic emotion of love of self finally evolved itself into its most primary duality, and that was the psychic attraction of male and female and the rise of the family, in which a number of emotions began to develop and integrate together. There was not only in this level love of man and woman, but there was love of parent and child, and also love of child and parent. And again, an overtone, an emotional devotion or patriotism to the protection of the home as a psychic entity. Thus these emotions began to expand in the laboratory of relationships. And by degrees, the equilateral triangle in these relationships was established. And the Greeks recognized these relationships as composed of three radiating areas. And that these three radiating areas, each radiating to the other points of the same triangle, resulted in an equilibrium in which balance was preserved only because each of the persons preserved and protected the essential principle of home or family. Thus, the success of emotion 
depended upon it being administrated from a level above itself. As long as the individual thought only of himself, the home was at best a hypothetical unit. But when he thought of the home first as a kind of sacred need or institution, then he was able to administer the individual elements of the pattern more successfully. Thus he had to have a vision above the level of his conduct in each instance. And the vision of the importance perhaps originally established by religious tradition, that the home must be defended, must be preserved, must be protected, and caused to flourish, and that the home in turn became the theater for the growth and expression and experience of the child, caused the two parents, in the name of home and of the child, to be unselfish. And this was one of the first instincts in which the person found the fulfillment of love through self-forgetfulness and in the recognition of the need of the lesser, the child, and in the need or in the sublimity of the greater, the concept of home itself. We had some new allegiances set into the emotional activity of the human being. These allegiances led to self sacrifice and self-sacrifice for a worthy cause or a worthy purpose was slowly revealed to be one of the most successful practices in the universe. This in turn ennobled the individual. Self-sacrifice requires discipline and discipline will never be imposed without purpose. So ideals discipline conduct, needs discipline action, and the enlarging family discipline the parents in the budgeting of their means and in the fact that they were no longer free and without care or burden. So burden of a proper nature, properly accepted, became indicative of growth because by burden the individual was inspired to exert his own will, increase his own powers, develop his own resources in order that he might meet the rising tide of responsibility. Gradually he found that this, like work, became a saving grace. He found that to the degree that he could unite, that he could bind these other free factors together, he became an integrated human being. Social consciousness became important to him. And through this social consciousness, he began to find an escape from his own ego, from the relentless and ruthless pressure of hyper-individualism. As time went on, these emotions gradually increased and enlarged. And probably in primitive tribal life, the next great enlargement was through religion. Religion was to the primitive man merely an extension of the concept of home. We still refer to heaven as our heavenly home. We refer to God as Father. And these were primitive discoveries. Man seeking a larger field or theater began to see the universe as the primordial source of the innumerable triplicity of parent uh, and child that was visible everywhere. So man began to have a new and greater unity, the unity of God, the sense of a superior object of devotion, by means of which he gained control of a new sphere of emotional expression in the material world. He had to ascend in order to control or to govern. He ascended to family and escaped the individual. He ascended to God 
and escape the boundaries of family, of race, of nation, of tribe, and of clan. So that he had a new point of elevation, a new and larger medium of interpretation and discrimination. So that gradually he began to recognize the importance of others of the same belief, of the same faith. He began to see larger fields of self-forgetfulness. He could serve not only his human friend or his family, but he could also serve his God. And he learned that he served his God by serving others. And he got a new and moral justification for unselfishness. Nature was instinctively trying to break down selfishness, which is isolation. As a result of these changes, we find the love of God emerging as a tremendous factor. Now, strangely enough, the love of God resulted in another emotion that was very important, and that was friendship, which is the natural love of one human being for another, where there are no arbitrary ties or no form of bondage, a spontaneous attachment due to similarities of interest or similarities of intent in life. Thus, the individual can be unselfish to his friend. And friendship, because it is not rooted in requirement, is not based in law, but is a dynamic individual choice of the individual himself, is placed higher on the Greek ladder of affections uh, than those relationships which are required by the state or are enforced by tradition. We find in the New Testament, of course, the emphasis upon the fact that Jesus called his disciples his friends. And that in this friendship concept, there was the beginning of the possibility of a universality of distribution of affection. A universality, however, which did not mean a scattering, but a constantly increasing opportunity to release and thus to escape from uh, the intense personal restrictions which we place upon ourselves. If, therefore, we are thinking in terms of modern human affections as they are in this world today, we realize the great importance of love as a means of helping the person to free himself from the limitations of his own sense of self-identity. Not always self-importance, but self-identity. And we also know, as the Persian and the mystics of the Near East so well understood, that love is something uh, which can never be taken for granted and can never be allowed merely to continue or to drift along without that attentiveness and care with which all things in life must be nourished and supervised if we wish them to produce their greatest harvests of good. It is therefore very essential that in our affections we use certain basic discrimination and certain basic philosophical and religious rules and principles in order that we may not only gain the satisfaction of loving but may also gain the great and deep satisfaction of being loved. There is always a saying that has been quite old, that in order to have a friend, you must be a friend. And this is true, that it also on the term of love. For in order to be loved, the individual must be lovable. Now, many allegiances can be formed in life, which might cause us to feel that the improvement of ourselves, for instance, is not essential to a happy marital relation. But if we go into the problem more carefully, we will realize that it is 
vitally important, perhaps more important than any other equation that can occur. The individual who does not possess within himself those attributes of character which naturally, normally, and instinctively attract affection cannot successfully demand affection. Affection is not a duty. It is not the duty of the child to love the parent unless that parent is lovable. It may be the duty of the child to obey, to respect, and to keep certain social patterns. But love is bestowed voluntarily or it does not exist. You cannot force it. And the reason why we naturally respect, admire, and love people is because they possess attributes and qualities and temperaments and dispositions which are essentially fine. If then we observe persons who complain that their lives have been loveless, we are likely to find persons who are not essentially lovable. Tragedy may, under certain conditions, create frustrations. And for all persons may go through periods in which their natural emotions are inhibited. But a lifelong account of such condition always bears witness to a basic temperamental debility of some kind. The individual is not proving through conduct that he deserves what he desires. So we wonder why persons are not lovable. And we try to find out a little bit about what causes persons to be less attractive to others. And we find dispositionally speaking that individuals who lack a reasonable integration within themselves and are therefore not dependable, not reasonable, not both idealistic and realistic, who have within themselves no contentment of spirit, are not essentially lovable. Yet these are the ones who most demand it. And they most demand it because they are most uncomfortable. So the more, more woebegone the person is in his own life, the more desperately he seeks escape. And where he is inhibited and frustrated in his own self-expression, he demands and requires and frequently makes a very heavy burden out of attempting to almost legislate the affections of those around him. Also we observe from a long historical survey that everyone who is loved is not perfect. Let us get out of that problem also before it uh, takes the proportion of appearing as though only the sanctified can be the objects of devotion. It is not true at all. In the first place, the average person who loves is not sufficiently integrated on his own level of criticism to recognize perfection if he saw it, and he does not demand it. What he generally demands from anyone with whom he expects to build a life or to have an association is a certain natural integration of being, a reasonable amount of poise, a cheerful disposition, a pleasant manner, a neat appearance, and a meeting upon some level of internal understanding. He doesn't demand perfection, no one does. And uh, he does, uh, the person does, however, demand some point of contact. Now let's take just such a simple little point as a cheerful disposition. Now it would seem that this could be cultivated in some way. 
Yet under pressure, it is one of the first things that disintegrates. And you would be surprised how many persons, from either their philosophies of living or their lack of such philosophies, are not naturally cheerful people. What they are are people who want someone else to cheer them up. So they go around trying to find someone who will, in one way or another, take away their gloom. This is wrong, but common, and quite understandable. Also, the natural uh, capacity to be loved is, of course, one of the great secrets of drawing affection. The individual who simply loves to be loved, wants to be, needs to be, and knows it, will seldom go without affection. If this instinct is sufficiently strong to cause them to make a reasonable personality adjustment, but to be loved simply because we want to be loved and not because we have any attributes worthy of it, will generally go uh, a little bit begging in this world of ours. Then uh, the, in the opportunities of life, we know that the human being is seeking some kind of completeness. He is seeking a kind of integration by means of which the three parts of his own nature can be brought into harmony. And that is his mental, emotional, and physical lives. Through the material structure of work, through his business and his home, through the social relationships on the objective level, through the responsibilities, duties, burdens, and crises of physical living, the individual is gradually being taught to discipline what might be termed his material nature or his physical integration of faculties. In the development of his interests, his activities, and in the advancement of his professions and arts, the individual is also gradually taught to discriminate and develop his intellectual potentials. He is gradually helped to a level of mental sharing with those around him, and enriches and increases and broadens and deepens his reflective powers. Through his emotions, the individual also must gain an adjustment, an adjustment which makes life purposeful, useful, and meaningful. And it is in his emotions that these ulterior motives cause him the greatest amount of trouble, because if his ulterior motives are physically <coughs> expressed, he is probably going to commit a crime. If they are mentally expressed, he is probably going to get himself into serious difficulties. But if they are emotionally expressed, they simply leave him unadjusted with very often no penalties exacted that are tangible or understandable to him. But he pays the big penalty, and that is the penalty of years of misery, which he does not need to face. Most miserable persons have been defeated in love, or have defeated it themselves by their own attitudes. And these are the ones who should begin to recognize the importance of giving rather than of receiving as a means of solving any kind of a problem. Unselfish people can achieve a magnificent victory over aloneness or isolation or over difficulties. Actual case histories may require special treatment and special counseling. But in the broad and general, the individual who has simple understanding achieves the best, accomplishes the most. And in the society of our world today, the mind and the heart are represented by the two great polarities of humanity, male and female. The mentality of the world, its mental and, and, and uh, reflectional faculties, 
are generally associated with the male. But the great civilizing forces of the world have always been associated with woman. Because in her, the emotional factor has greater meaning, greater clarity, greater intensity, and greater opportunity than in the case of man, whose responsibilities for providing have long, for ages, dominated his activities and his time. But in the case of woman today, the power of love to rule the world is powerfully invested. Mahatma Gandhi said on one occasion that we would never have peace in this world until men were held together by nothing stronger than the silken cord of love. And the power to bring a civilization to emotional maturity belongs to woman and begins in the training of her children and the extension of her life in her family and finally out into all branches of human society. It is then most important that the maturing of the emotional instinct should be associated with the rising social, political, economic significance of woman. It is her privilege to block and change some of these courses of action which are so likely to drench our world in disaster. To do these things, she must realize the importance of love as a giving of self to purpose greater than self. That it is the love that she gives and not the love that she gets that makes the world strong for her and strong for every other living creature. That it is not the children loving her that enriches her, that enriches them. It is her love for them which enriches her. It is the action which enriches and not the reward of the action. And as rapidly as the human being realizes that it is not what he gets for what he does, but the dynamic of doing it that makes him grow. And therefore, love given is love found. Love kept is love lost. The individual who tries to fill the emotional need of life by requiring attention will die empty. But the individual who finds that the fulfillment of this emptiness is by the releasing of streams within the self will find also the tremendous fullness of giving and that today is one of the greatest problems that the world faces and the greatest problem the American home faces is the realist realization of maturity through release from within self that we are not better because we have more but because we give more and that which is forever asking to be given and which enriches and perfects all things by the giving, is love. And that this in itself, as its own reward, cannot be defeated by the indifference of others. Nor can it be frustrated because it is not returned. The individual must give of it simply because it is the only way in which he can be the fullness of himself and can at the same time achieve the civilization of his world. For the next great thing that this world must know is the mystery of love operating in economics, in politics, in international relationships, in daily living, in social relations, and in the home. And the great opportunity of bringing this about is strongly presented to the American woman who wants to make her contribution to society greater and richer, but who has not yet for the most part realized that her happiness is not in her security or in her possessions or in her ability to influence some man 
or her ability to dominate. Her tremendous strength lies in her ability to give and thereby grow. And through the expression of love released undemandingly, without reward or expectation of return, simply the tremendous experience of loving, by means of which, incidentally, she becomes lovable. These things will strengthen homes, strengthen society, make a better world to live in, and will probably help you over till next week. <laughs> now, I'd like to uh, make a couple of announcements that are rather pressing. We hope you will be interested in them. Uh, this afternoon, at our headquarters, there will be open house. We hope everyone who can will come. Bring your friends with you. We will have exhibits in the library, and we will have refreshments. And uh, we'll be most happy to see you any time between 2 and 4.30. Become better acquainted with what we are trying to do. It will help you to perhaps tell your friends a little more about it, and all that type of thing. I'd like to also announce that the spring issue of Horizon is on the table this morning. Due to the sudden interest in the field of reincarnation and the recent disturbances in that field, which threaten to increase ad nauseum, I have held the article which I intended to publish in order that we might make it a more comprehensive summary. So it will be held over until the next issue. It would seem better uh, to watch developments a little longer and see if we could perhaps uh, make a more telling contribution in this department. So we ask your patience and indulgence on that one article. I think you will find, however, many items of interest in the magazine which will more than justify uh, your subscribing to it after you have maybe secured a sample copy. Next Sunday morning we have chosen a subject which perhaps is a little different from our usual run and certainly a departure from the traditional uh, concepts that we have of Freudian psychoanalysis. We're going to take the book and review it and study it. Sigmund Freud's book, Moses and Monotheism. The effect of the life of Moses upon the religion of the Jews and of Christianity, and also a psychological study of Moses and the circumstances which lead in world affairs to the establishment of a new religious dispensation. Why we have new religions, how they come about, and their impact upon world culture in general. I think it is a fortunate subject, and we hope that you will enjoy it. On the book table this morning, we have a number of used books for your consideration. We hope you will find something interesting. And we hope that you will all, uh, this week, make a serious effort to see how far and how deeply you can penetrate into some simple problem of your living. By turning toward things and persons, their simple desire to do them good or to do them well, recognizing that the love of work makes us do it well instinctively and thus be normal, and that love of persons cause us to serve th those persons well and naturally, and thus grow, unfold, deepen, and mature as we were intended to do. And thank you very much.